plenary session um, with our guest speaker, Bruno Landis. I am, um, my name is Gabi Heil. I'm a professor of Germanic studies and I'm the recently appointed acting head of the Department of French, Hispanic and Italian studies. So um, just to give you that as a background, <laughs> I'm personally very new to this department. Um, that comprises French, Hispanic, Italian studies, and that also has a committee on um, medieval studies together with other units in the Faculty of Arts um, who organized this wonderful conference here. So, um, so it's great having here this AIDS colloquium of the Gregorian Institute of Canada, and it's even a greater pleasure having Professor William Randwick here. Um, Professor Randwick um, holds degrees from the University of British Columbia, a Bachelor and Masters of Music, and um, PhD and um, Philosophy, Master of Philosophy from the City University of New York. Uh, he is a professor of music theory in the School of the Arts at McMaster University at present. And he's also a founding member of this society, the Gregorian Institute of Canada. So his speech today, his presentation today, will be about an editorial project he has going on. Um, it is a multi-volume modern performing and scholarly edition of all the surviving liturgy and music of the Sarum Rite. And um, yeah, it seems that, um, so I, as, as I told you, I'm a scholar of Germanic studies. I am um, I'm very interested in medieval studies as well, and I am doing um, quite a bit of scholarly editing um, concerning literature. So um, I was very intrigued by reading your um, project and publications records, um, how many editorial projects uh, to uh, medieval chant and Gregorian chant you are bringing to the academic world and to your colleagues. And I think that everyone here is very much looking forward to your presentation. And please join me in welcoming Professor Randwick. Thank you very much. So it's great to be here. It's very exciting for me. And um, sometimes I wonder whether any of this internet stuff is actually noticed by anybody. <laughs> so it was so exciting to see the last presentation that uh, excerpts from this project are being used in Japan. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> I know we're going to get hungry soon, so I'm going to go along as quick as possible through this material. <clears throat> so the paper is intended in part as an introduction to, uh, to Sarum Chant in general, and also part as an explanation of the plan and progress of this large project called the Sarum Rite which appears on the internet, just that address. So the history, the Sarum Rite is perhaps best understood as being based on a combination of Anglo-Saxon and French traditions developed in the aftermath, aftermath of the Norman Conquest. Let's see, does this work? <laughs> a prehistoric hill fort in Wiltshire became under the Romans the fortified town of Sorviodono, from which Salisbury, Sarum, and Salisbury are derived. Under the Anglo-Saxons, a Christian church was built there, and following the Norman conquest, a castle and cathedral were constructed during the time of Bishop Osmond, a Norman who died in 1099, and who was also Chancellor of England, and Earl of Dorset, and Bishop of Sarum. Although St. Osmond is accorded prominence in the establishment of the Sarum Rite, the extent of his activity is not accurately known. The disadvantages of the hilltop site eventually led in 1219 to the siting of a new cathedral and the building of a new town on the banks of the River Avon under the leadership of Bishop <coughs> Richard Poor. And the new cathedral was constructed in 1220 to 1258 and is dedicated to St. Mary. 
Thus, Sarum took to heart the growing veneration of Mary that characterized the later Middle Ages. Like other large secular establishments staffed by regular canons, Sarum maintained a full round of daily liturgical offices from Matins through Compline, as well as two or three dozen masses per day in the various chapels and chantries of the church. The customary and ordinal of Sarum developed uh, at Salisbury provided detailed regulations governing the structure of the establishment as well as directing the order of the liturgy. And these rules and guidelines were adopted by many other churches throughout the British Isles. And thus, at a time when local customs pervaded liturgy in the West, the Sarum liturgy and ceremony became renowned throughout Europe. With the advent of printing, many editions of Sarum liturgical documents appeared, such as the Missal, Breviary, Antiphonale, Graduale, and Hymnale. In the early 16th century, under Henry VIII, the Sarum Rite became the sole authorized form of worship throughout the realm. And the Sarum Rite was finally superseded by the English Book of Common Prayer in Britain in 1558 on the death of Mary Tudor, and prior to the institution of the Tridentine reforms on the continent. Thus, the Sarum Rite was in no way affected by the alterations brought about by the Roman Catholic Reformation. Like the Milanese and Dominican forms, the Sarum Rite was never formally abolished by the Roman Catholic Church. And despite the ravages of the Reformation and the Interregnum, during which time so much of medieval culture was destroyed, a virtually complete, complete set of Sarum liturgical documents is available for study. In comparison, sources of other rites, such as York, Lincoln, or Her Hereford, to name a few, are only partially extant. So now a little bit about myself and how I got into this. In 1979, I began work as a church organist here in Vancouver. My first appointment was at Augustana Lutheran Church. While practicing in the organ loft one day, a Roman Catholic priest came up and introduced himself to me as Father Donald Nielsen. <laughs> he had been brought up in this very Lutheran church, but particularly under the influence of Healy Willen, he had developed a deep passion for the Catholic liturgy and music and had subsequently joined the Roman Catholic Church and become a priest. Father Nielsen invited me to play organ for Sunday Vespers at his church, and there I accompanied the chanted psalms and hymns uh, that were sung mostly from the English hymnal. Meanwhile, under the inspiration of a certain William Mart, <laughs> Father Nielsen was becoming increasingly interested in the Latin chant and was here at the University of British Columbia that he introduced a small group of enthusiasts, myself and Mark Donnelly, and Michael, Harry included, to Latin, to the square notation, and to the Libre Usualis. We parted ways as Father Nielsen went on to found a short-lived oratory in Ottawa, and I went on to graduate studies in music theory in New York. And it was in New York that I chanced on the Order of Vespers, which provided a detailed English version of the Sarum of Vespers, and this is by G.H. Palmer from the uh, early part of the um, 20th century. All three, the English hymnal, the Libre Joralis, and the Order of Vespers, I consulted frequently during this period. Not long after being appointed to the faculty at McMaster University in 1988, while wandering its hollow, hallowed halls, I chanced upon a pile of old books outside an office, bearing the notice, free books. <laughs> <laughs> There were, in fact, the three-volume Sarum Breviary, the Proctor and Wordsworth edition of the 19, 1880s, all in Latin, of which I knew only a little, and with no music. Over the years, I perused these books, trying to make sense of them, and at the same time, I explored the possibilities of chant worship through the establishment of monthly Vespers services at St. John's Church in Hamilton. These services gave me an opportunity to explore the, to explore the liturgy with freedom. They allowed me to piece together services from a variety of sources, but especially from those mentioned already. And we ended each service with a Marian antiphon in Latin from the Libri Juralis. And the founding director of the Gregorian Institute, William Oates, is a frequent participant in these services. He's not available to be here at this conference. So in, um, that's what this, the proctor uh, edition of the Sarum Breviary looks like. It's very good. And very long. In 2002, I received a copy of the newly published Nocturnale Romano, 
And I found this to be of great interest because its matins chants demonstrated the musical richness of the Roman breviary. That's all the responsories, of course. And also because Peter Holger Sandhofer had indicated the manuscript sources of the chants. Um, you know, it's frustrating with the Libre Usual. You wonder where these things come from and how they got to be the way they are. So, it's <coughs> <extended> by that. <clears throat> Meanwhile, um, during 2002 to 2003, the Gregoire chant program became available. This seemed to me an ideal way to transcribe square notation, and I began using it to prepare music for performance. During 2004, I edited the Sarum Tonary for Thesaurus Musicarum Latinarum at Indiana University. And all through this period, my interest in chant continued to grow. And then finally, in 2005, I finally got hold of the Walter Frere facsimile of the Ante Finale, Sarum Spiriense. Suddenly, I felt I had all the resources that I needed in order to begin preparing a noted Sarum breviary, reliable sources for both music and text. And I would at last be able to see how the whole Sarum liturgy of the hours worked. At the same time, we were founding the GIC, and we felt that it was very important that GIC had both a practical focus and a research focus. And you can see that being played out very well in this conference, I think. It's very exciting. <clears throat> I determined that I would undertake an edition of the Sarum Road Breviary, containing all the texts, rubrics, and music for the office throughout the year. Publishing on the internet seemed appropriate, since such a large project could easily stall before it stalled the light of day in book form, and expenses could be kept to a minimum. The internet allows for revisions and corrections to be made without issuing a new print copy each time. And it also allowed interaction with others along the way, whether by way of criticism, correction, or encouragement. Right. So that's what it looks like. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, for example, the first part of the Psalter has been revised five times since it first appeared in 2006. And the first part of the Temporale has been revised four times. <clears throat> I formulated the idea to publish the work in installments of approximately 200 pages every six months and establish an advisory board that would help to oversee the work and guide it. And so, of course, this is a familiar opening we sang already today. Slightly different music. <laughs> Several features of the work then are of note. Um, first, uh, like in the uh, Nocturnale Romanum, the sources are, uh, for the text and the music of each item are indicated. <clears throat> Second, extensive end notes allow for the incorporation of scholarly apparatus, of variant readings, corrections, and commentary, etc. And third, the in inclusion of the cantus numbers so we can cor correlate directly the Sarum chant to the, to the repertoire of plain chant as a whole. <clears throat> sure, so of course that's the first responsory for Advent. Around 2008, McMaster University subscribed to the early English books online, and this made available an extensive collection of over 100 printed Sarum books, dating from 1480 to 1558. So we have the same thing in print form. This is the, uh, yeah, the 1519 And here is the uh, beginning of the missal, the, the breviary, sorry, the breviary, the print breviary, no music, in it, just the text. And all of the rubrics, uh, the pika, and so on. <coughs> and Another print here is one of about half a dozen uh, hymnals. And like the hymn we sang this morning, one of the points of the Sarum hymnals, which is explained over here, is to make sure that the uh, alignment of text and of music is correct in every verse. So every verse of every hymn is printed out. Of course, this, this one is simple because it's one note so. I've also gained access to several other important manuscripts which have allowed for more comparative readings, leading to a more accurate edition. So, features of the Sarum Rite, what is this all about? Having been able to assemble the text and music, we're in a position to consider what it is that distinguishes the Sarum from Roman, Dominican, or any other Western liturgical tradition. And the following are some preliminary observations. 
As mentioned above, Sarum in its inception was a combination of indigenous Anglo-Saxon uh, worship, which is Western, straight Western, really, uh, and imported Norman liturgy. This gives a distinctive quality to the Sarum calendar, as can be seen in comparison with the contemporaneous Roman breviary of 1529. So those are in Sarum and not in the Roman. These are in Roman and not in Sarum. It's not a complete list, but it's, it's the, main, the main parts. So Sapitius, so um, Wolfson of Worcester, Julian of Lama. So there's French as well as um, English and Anglo-Saxon in here. Bridget of Kildare, David of Wales, Chad of Mercia, Edward, King of England. Cuthbert of Northumbria, Richard of Chichester, Alfage, Erkenwald of London, John of Beverly, Dunstan of Glastonbury, Aldon of Sherburne, Augustine of Canterbury, Basil the Great, Alden the Martyr, Ethelred of Ely, Swithin of Winchester, Osmond of Salisbury, and so on. Anyone else interested? But Maurice and Companions, which is a French one. Michael on Mount Tumba, in his French. Crispin and Crispinian of Gaul. Um, the benefit of Wales, uh, and so on. The saints conspicuously, I think, absent from the Salon Terran calendar as compared to the Roman calendar are, as you can see them here, the octave of the conception, all the first hermit, Ignatius of Antioch, Anthony of Egypt, Chrysostom, Dorothy of Caesarea, the guardian angels, Aquinas, uh, Gabriel the Archangel, Joseph, Joachim, Vincent, Zenor, Bernard of Clairvaux, Francis, Martha, Claire, and Louis, King of France, <laughs> of the all saints, and various popes. Awesome but you get a feeling for the, the different focus. And, um, so we have more Gallican, Anglo Saxon, and Celtic saints over here. More Eastern, more biblical, uh, more popes. Yeah. <laughs> and also observances of later medieval religious leaders Francis Clare, Bernard, Aquinas. But overall, something like half of the saints' days are different which has a major impact on the liturgy, since something like half of all the days in the liturgical year would be devoted to saints. Um, features of the chant itself, in comparisons with Roman and Dominican forms, will be discussed and illustrated at the workshops scheduled for tomorrow. Um, but to encapsulate, there are differences throughout the rite, both of, both of text and of music. I'll quickly mention some, but certainly not all, of the important features, which may differ. Uh, this is important to keep in mind as I talk differing either from the pre-Tridentine Roman liturgy or from the post-Tridentine Roman liturgy, which are not the same. Right? So, um, in the Sarum rite, uh, first off, antiphons are rarely sung through before psalms and canticles. The norm is always just the inch of it, or whatever it is. Um, their only exceptions are first vespers, first vespers of approximately 15 very high feasts during the year, during which the entire antiphon is sung before and after the Magnificat. So this example here, this famous antiphon, which is from second vespers of Christmas, would only be sung through at the end. By the way, uh, you know, there, there are details throughout which are different. If you know this one, the uh, Libri Ujala's form is that's the kind of thing you find all the time throughout. Um, yeah. So going on then to the psalm tones. Uh, Sarum has a different set of psalm tone endings. Well, many of them are the same, but there are many different ones as well. Here we are at tone one, uh, which has nine possible terminations, of which number six and seven do not appear in the Libri Dralis. And they're clearly designed as variants of number five, which will connect with variant and openings. Also, I might mention uh, that the mediations are not always the same. The, uh, what we sang this morning was, but here it's as simple as, and Sarum has no flex anywhere, ever. Just, just there. Different, but. <laughs> okay. Um, solemn tones. So the Benedictus and the Magnificat uh, would be sung to solemn tones, more ornamental versions. 
In this example, we see the first mediation is connected. Uh, well, here's the mediation now. Uh, it's called, and uh, yeah, it's the mediation that's different. Uh, and of course, these these you will find in the, the Roman versions as well. But what we don't find is the additional inflection here at the beginning of the second half. We are busy And also um, a minor point, but I find it very interesting, is that uh, the sarum seems to be quite strict in these um, solid tones at putting this part on, on an accent. Whereas we find in the visuals, for example, Gloria um, Patri. Something like that, but the sarum would be Gloria Patri. But these are minor things, but they add up after a while to a different flavor. Right. Numas. Sarum chant uses numas, and a numa is, uh, we'll learn more about them maybe tomorrow. William? We'll learn more about numas tomorrow? No. Okay. The uh, the decorated endings right? will be found at the end of antiphons. Sarah Chant uses numas to conclude the final antiphon on the psalms at each of the nocturnes, and the, after the final psalm lauds and the vespers, and to conclude the antiphon of Benedictus Magnificat and Quicunque Volt throughout the year, except from Passion Sunday to the Octave of Easter and in the Office of the Dead. And this example shows the first three. Um, these examples, uh, actually, from the Sarum Tonary, uh, have an intonation formula followed by the pneuma itself here. And these intonation formulas have standardized uh, biblical texts as mnemonic, mnemonic devices. So just sing the first one for fun. Just please join in if you like. Mm -hmm. And they do form then kind of punctuation points along uh, major dividing points of the service, actually. And the other thing you find if you use them regularly is it it changes the way you organize your rep. Because typically you can say, oh, well, we're, we're coming to the end. We don't need a new rep. But when you realize you've got a long way to go, then you, you need a different strategy to deal with that. OK. Venites. And we sang a venite this morning to uh, just a single tone. If you want to look at the um, or standard uh, venites, then you might look at the Liber Hymnarius, which has a large collection of the venites. Uh, and you'll see where they're similar and different to these. But we have our own particular versions of them. I'll sing a little for you. This will be all sung by a soloist or a pair, perhaps. All right. With regard to the set pieces, antiphons, responsories, introits, graduals, etc., Sarum chant sometimes uses the same pieces as the Roman, sometimes the same as the Dominican, and sometimes completely different. And if you come to the workshops tomorrow, you will uh, experience that. Um, this particular symbol here, two of them there, um, does show up in the Sarum uh, manuscripts and in prints as well, though the prints seem to use a variety of different symbols because they don't have quite the same font available as the hand as the manuscript. And um, so this, this is found, and 
in the addition, it's transcribed in a way that hopefully makes the performance clear. It seems to me um, uh, that it's essentially a uh, square note rendering of the Leon style Pestrophicus. And uh, I call it kind of an S. And the equivalent to that really is, is a lengthening of the upper note, or a doubling of the upper note, if you prefer, just to say it that way. And so this is a transcription of that. Here, the doubling, and here, the doubling. And um, and the rising from the dead. And uh, Ted, it's following in on your idea of yesterday. The rising <laughs> is rising here. And the lengthening of the upper note just emphasizes that uh, rising pattern as well. And so, so that's the way the transcriptions are looking for that particular symbol. Sarum uh, is an all square notation, and so there are no cholismas anywhere. Uh, when Quilismas appear in Salem's books, we find in the Sarum either a regular square note at that spot, or we find there's a blank at that spot, and, and there'd be a leap. It's, not, it's, it's, it's one or the other, it seems to be happening. In the repertoire itself, there are many interesting items. Um, some of you may know of this one, it's the eighth uh, O antiphon of that event. So the Sarum liturgy pushes the O antiphons one day earlier and adds an eighth one, O Virgo Virginum, same tune. And it's slightly different to text style of the other ones, but nevertheless, it, uh, it connects um, the O antiphons, the prophetic O antiphons, then maybe more directly with the <coughs> incarnation, and certainly with Sarum's focus on Mary as well. I also draw your attention to this special Sarum mode 2 tone ending, which is used with these, with the regular mode 2 ending. So the more decorative there. Uh, Sarum includes a number of um, extra liturgical items, proses, uh, which are used uh, often in processions. And here we have a procession for the Feast of St. Stephen on the Eve of St. Stephen. <coughs> These are quite interesting because we have, um, we have the cantors singing a line and the choir repeating the same music just on a vocalized vowel while everyone's um, marching along uh, to the altar of St. Stephen. Whether it's a musical effect or whether it's, uh, of course, when you're marching, you may have a book in your hand, but you need a lot of books then. So uh, it's nice though. We've sung these before. So if you all want to join in a little bit, I'll sing the line and you sing on ah when we get there. <laughs> Continues obviously, Kyrie lays on later on 
and then the tropes are added. If you'd like to join in the Domine, um, no, join in three times Curie, so let's join in on the second Curie. Sunday in the liturgy in which this can be sung. It's only sung on the weekdays. After. It's sung on the weekday. No. That's exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, on a free weekday. Yeah. The um, there's an extensive trope curiale, and I'll just draw your attention to this one because it's so well known. But as we sing it, you'll notice the melody is not quite what you might expect. Orbis factor. Anyone sing Orbis Factor ever? Here we go. Orbis Factor. selection of sequences, some of which are well known and some of which are relatively obscure. And here the one for St. Andrew, and I'll just point out, it's got great examples of the so-called Gallican cadence, or lower leading tone cadence, here, because it's B-flat, but you'll see it up front. And And a number of offertory verses, which would be used during the weekdays. Verses beginning here, for example, would be used during the weekdays, not on Sundays. In terms of the music itself, of the ordinary and proper of the Mass, of the antiphons and responsories and hymns of the office, we find numerous variants in the Roman forms throughout the repertoire. Often the variants are a matter of different note here and there, added, replaced, or subtracted. But there are also a good number of instances where the music diverges considerably in comparison to the Roman forms. In several instances where completely different pieces are used. And once again, the workshops will go into that in detail. The Matins lessons 
um, have extensive readings from the venerable bead, venerable bead and others, which are not found in the Chodenti and modern breviaries, of course. The processional, the Sarum Rite includes an extensive and detailed processional with descriptions and illustrations of the order of processions on major feasts. And here we have uh, um, Christmas. And this actually is a, a diagram of the order of the procession the thoroughfare in the front, the uh, cross bearers, deacons, candelabra holders, the sword. That's the asparagus for the home. Yeah, that's it's for giving. These are the thoroughfares, the uh, bishop or head priest at the end. And it seems to me, uh, as I study these, that these lines are actually important in representing where in the church they're lining up in relation to the chancel step. Okay. Yeah. Because those, those lines appear on different diagrams in different places, actually. Yeah. Yeah. These, are, these represent people, right? <laughs> they're bald heads. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, I thought I'd be very interested in this piece, which we sang last night uh, in, the, in the Sarum form, because it, it includes uh, extensive tropes here as well. So if we have time, maybe we'll, we'll have a go at this. I think we'll have time. <laughs> um, so we're just going to go through, uh, I'll just give you a heads up as to what's happening. There is where the tropes begin in the blue. I do occasionally use uh, accidentals above the staff to indicate editorial, you know, suggestions. So, it's quite an extensive amount of all of that. So, of course, it's, it's between the old polkers and old dolchers and all. It's really nice. So, you want to sing it? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs>
sensing, the use of candles, bowing, genuflecting, kneeling, prostration, and all the rest of that good stuff. No doubt, however, um, rubrics would have to be adapted as necess necessary to local conditions in smaller locations, which should not have all the resources in the whole choral establishment. The rubrics re are reflecting what ought to be going on at the cathedral church itself, 
but you can imagine what might happen in a little parish church with maybe a priest and a deacon or something. And also the ceremony includes detailed pica or rubrics that indicate the proper offices and liturgies to perform, be performed on any, any given day in any of the 35 possible years, or 70 if you include uh, leap years. The example uh, shows the beginning of the pica uh, for Advent 1, uh, sorry, the first, Trini first Sunday after Trinity in the year 1A, A being the letter which indicates that Sunday falls on January the 1st, and one indicating the first of the five possible weeks in which Easter may fall. Seven that's five is 35 possibilities. So you can imagine the pages and pages and pages of this stuff. On the first Sunday after the Feast of Trinity, all of the service will be on the octave of Corpus Christi. The first Vespers, which is of St. Aldum, will be made in memory of St. Germanus, of the octave, with the antiphon of the Ramos Gavis, and nothing will be made of the Sunday, nor of the Trinity, nor will there be procession, uh, which will be, because this uh, will be deferred for the next Sunday, etc., etc. <laughs> if you like that kind of thing, and I love it. <laughs> okay. And I put out uh, as an example what would be happening uh, in the year 2013 in August, when we are right now, right? Here's, here's what's happening. And we are, we are on today, which is the Feast of the Most Holy Name of Jesus, Greater double with nine lessons, that's as high as you can get, and a full octave. But going back to the beginning of the month, just compare this to what would be happening, say, today. So, Feast of St. Peter's Chains, Feast of St. Stephen Pope, Invention of St. Stephen, the First Martyr, Tenth Sunday after Trinity, all of, all of the Sunday. Um, okay, Monday, Feast of St. Oswald, Tuesday, uh, which is actually going to be omitted in favor of the commemoration of the Blessed Virgin Mary instead. That's the full office of the Virgin, which would normally be on Saturday, but Saturday is busy, so we'll put it on Monday. <laughs> Feast of the Transfiguration, Feast of the Most, uh, which is, and the Feast of the Most Holy Name, as I say, is bigger than the Transfiguration. Uh, it lasts all week. The octave <laughs> of the uh, Feast of the Holy Name is coming along here, the octave, so we don't count that one. We don't count that one. St. Lawrence is a big one, so it trumps the octave of the holy name. We come to the Sunday, which would be the 11th Sunday after Trinity, but the octave of the name actually trumps that. So that is only, um, that mass is only said in chapter. Right. The Monday is of the octave, and this is actually of uh, the saint, the lessons of the octave, and so on. So you can see it's a busy time um, of the octave. This is still the octave of the holy name. <clears throat> then right after that, of course, we're on to the Assumption. It's the very next day. And so another full octave going to the Assumption. Uh, uh, so again, the, the Sunday is omitted in favor of the octave of the Assumption going on here all the way down in the octave day itself, and then we're back up to something more like regularity with the saint's day, the saint's day, and then actually an actual Sunday on the 25th of the month. Um, commemorations of St. Mary uh, here, commemoration of St. Thomas of Canterbury here, and commemoration of the uh, saint of the church, which actually St. Mary in this case, so it doesn't matter. But if it was another church, it would be their local saint. And then St. Augustine, St. John, St. Clarice, and saints, 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 all the time, basically. There were only, I don't think there were any days in that month that weren't either a Sunday or a saint's day. But that's typical, really. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so where, where have we got to this project? So the Psalter is complete. And up on the internet, and the temporale is complete, and the sanctorale, uh, we've got a complete draft, and the first quarter of it is up on the internet, and it should be all done in another little while. Um. <clears throat> now, I have been approached several times about uh, the English language, and what about the English language? 
and uh, I had assistance from a lady, Claire Gishard of Australia, and she encouraged me in 200, 2010 to embark upon the English language version of all of this, which I had begun. And so the main problem with doing it in English is uh, what kind of English? <laughs> what kind of English? And me being me, um, and following the kind of sources that I was uh, brought up on the English hymnal and the Palmer and so on.